Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and our special guest today is Jenny Mannion, and she's here to share with us Love 365. Now, many of you know Jenny. She's been on the show before. She's an international best-selling author, speaker, highly sought-after intuitive, self-love activator, and media personality. She graduated from Penn State with a BA in psychology and a keen interest in how our minds work. It was through healing herself from seven years of several debilitating chronic diseases in three weeks that Jenny found her passion to help others. She is an intuitive healer, mind-body-spirit mentor, and energetic catalyst who inspires people to connect to their inner power, develop greater healing and expansion, and create the lives they desire. Certified in over 15 healing modalities, Jenny's intuitive gifts led her to create the online class Embracing Bliss and the highly popular app Love365, which offers bite-sized actions and daily love notes to support your healing and ignite your inner flame. So let's welcome to the show, Jenny Mannion. I am so grateful to be here. Thanks for having me. It's always such a treat to spend time with you, Jenny. Why don't we start from the beginning? Why don't you share with our listeners what started you on this path? Absolutely. Well, I was sick for seven years with a lot of chronic illnesses and disease and went the traditional medical route and then even went what I considered the alternative medical route at the time, homeopathic. And while each thing might alleviate pain for a little bit of time, they all had me on a ton of medication and none were really getting to the root of the problem. And I wound up coming across a couple of things synchronistically and using them to change my energy and change my health and wound up healing myself in three weeks of seven years of chronic illness and disease. Now, you know, I, I, I love every time you talk about this, because for a lot of people, that seems like that's so, you know, just such a big thing to even accomplish. And how did you get to this place where you were able to heal yourself? I think the frustration with being sick for so long, uh, the final diagnosis I had gotten was that I would actually be in a wheelchair. And being a dancer growing up, that was about the worst diagnosis that I could get. And being open to other things. So when I came across the movie The Secret, when I came across things like gratitude, I recognized that, and I had graduated with a BA in psychology, so I did know how the mind worked, but you kind of forget. You get into trusting traditional medicine. You get into the limits. You get involved in the internet, reading all the symptoms and prognoses, and you become, it's really challenging to to see outside of that. But at some point I was able to be like, you know what, maybe there is an alternative. And I really started to focus on my thoughts, which were creating my energy and recognize that if I was waking up every morning, concentrating on my pain, instead of maybe what I was grateful for, the one part of my body that didn't hurt, I really wasn't allowing for my body to create healthy cells. I really wasn't allowing for any other possibility to come in and for me to be healthier. And there were a couple of things that just kind of led to me recognizing that, you know what, my mind hasn't been helping me. I've been really diving into that diagnosis, the prognosis, and what my life would look like in s- instead of trusting myself and speaking to myself in a much kinder way, it's really interesting how when we're sick, we're not nice to ourselves. We're even harder on ourselves. I'm not the mom I want to be. I'm not the wife I want to be. I'm not the friend I want to be or daughter I want to be. So when I started to switch that script that was going on in my head, it allowed for new energy. And I also bombarded myself with a lot of material, a lot of Deepak Chopra, or Wayne Dyer, or Caroline Mace, like anything I could get my hands on or watch videos of that would keep me in that inspirational mode. It sounds like when you remove that kind of negative energy, you had to fill the void and what a great place to fill with all that information. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And where we put our attention, that energy expands. And because our body is always creating new cells, and I know that pain is very debilitating and all consuming. Being in chronic pain for seven years, I I know how real that pain is. And it might seem really challenging to move beyond that to focus on something else, but only we can kind of give ourselves permission to do that. And even if it's not all day, even that focused attention for a few minutes a day can really start to switch the energy and switch how we're feeling. So other than changing your thoughts, what was like the second most important thing that you did that really helped you make those shifts? Gratitude was huge. Yeah, that is that part of the changing my thoughts, but the gratitude, the really sinking into, you know what, maybe I can't run after my kids, but I can read to them. It doesn't mean that I'm a lesser mom. Uh, sinking into shifting my attention to from the pain to what was good in my life. Really being aware of how I was influencing myself and also how the people around me were influencing me. Was I around people that were inspirational or was I around people that were draining my energy? There were so many things to focus on of where I was putting my energy and where I could switch that up to allow a different allow a change in my in my body in my mind and in my soul. Did you ever feel like as you were going through this process of just reawakening your soul that you got to this place where it's like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to get there? Yeah, I did not know I could heal myself, Mary. And that was never even given to me as a possibility when I started doing this focus. And I said, you know what, I don't have any doctors I need to be at, except for at the time I was on blood thinners to get that level check. I am going to not go to the doctors that are telling me I'm sick for a couple weeks and really focus my energy on healing. And I didn't know I could feel 100% better. But I was like, it can't hurt, you know, (laughs) can't hurt to start thinking about thinking of things differently, looking at things differently, and just seeing what that does. And it was miraculous to me that in three weeks, I was off of all painkillers and feeling good, feeling better than I had in almost a decade. I think that's so encouraging for a lot of people who are probably in that, you know, have been in that same place where they're, you know, maybe struggling with conventional medicine and and it doesn't seem to be working. I mean, what advice would you give those people? To really trust your inner self, be your best healthcare advocate. If a doctor doesn't feel right to you, there are other doctors out there. It was very interesting to me that when I was ill, I had a doctor that was consistently trying to push more medication on me. And I'd resisted the pain pills for a long long time. I resisted the antidepressants, never went on them because I said I wanted to know how I felt. I know that they do help other people. I'm not saying you shouldn't be on them. But really trusting your inner self. And when I healed, I went back to the doctor. My doctor had been replaced by an Eastern doctor. She was an Indian doctor. And her first words to me were, I don't prescribe medicine easily. Do you meditate? So, you know, I was like, wow, what a manifestation. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that's so great. It seems like everything just kind of fell into place for you because by the time you met her, you, you were starting to meditate, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And trusting yourself. And it's it's really challenging because doctors have these degrees and they are have the experience and we trust them. And not saying that you should not trust doctors, but find one that listens to you. Find one that is open to the mind-body approach as well, that really sees it as a holistic approach really asks you about, is there any stress in your life? Those are important questions. There are doctors in my area that really went away from the traditional medical way things are done because it was so stressful fitting in that many clients and they couldn't talk to them. And I actually see clients now, patients now for like an hour at a time to get into deeper what's going on in your life. You know, if there are stresses, if you're going through a relationship issue, if you're going through financial issues, obviously these things are going to affect you too, rather than just getting to, okay, physically this, this, and this, that really doesn't look at the person as a whole. Now, I know that you're this really gifted intuitive healer. 
when did that really start to show up for you during this journey? After healing, I found out, I was like, I want to scream this from the rooftops and go back to all the support groups and let them know you can heal yourself. And I found the vehicle of blogging to get my word out there. And I said, what better thing to keep me healthy than to learn about alternative ways of people healing themselves and mind-body medicine. And in doing that, I came across reconnective healing and I really was a skeptic. I really did not know my experience with energy healing was not the best. It was, you know, a guy in high school that I really thought liked to say he was an energy healer so he could get close to women more than anything else. So it was not like a positive experience. So when I heard about it, though, reconnective healing, like me, when I was reading that book, my body was tingling. Lights were going on and off. Like I was having these experiences that I could not explain and knew I needed to get a couple of reconnective healing sessions. And when I did that, I felt things I had never felt before and knew I needed to get to become a licensed practitioner in it. And I think during those sessions, well, reading the book, things started to open up. But when I started facilitating my first energy healing sessions, I started kind of receiving messages and didn't know where they were coming from, you know, spooked me a little bit at first, you know, like, am I reading these, this person's energy field? Where is this information coming from? But my follow up to that was taking classes in Akashic record reading. And that really allowed me to focus my attention on receiving answers and maybe where I was receiving answers from, and opened up my comfortability, I guess, with Mm -hmm. more of the maybe woo-woo, esoteric, or things just that I hadn't heard of before or really embraced before, and it made it feel more safe. I needed that proof. I really was a skeptic. I was more science-based, even though I had a a couple experiences as a child and teenager. Those had really kind of been pushed down, and I really didn't acknowledge them for what they were for a long time. So it really started opening up after I started putting my attention there and started being open to, you know what, I would love to be able to tune into people to help them. And we're so glad that you are. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it's interesting. I think this is a walk that you hear most often from people who you know, we're, we're living the normal life and all of a sudden, whap, you get hit across the forehead and, you know, all of a sudden you are seeing things or experiencing things that you have never done before. And I hear a lot of times people feel like they needed you know, like a padded room or something like who is talking <laughs> to me. <laughs> so you know, how did you discern that? How did you discern, okay, the voice that I'm hearing, you know, where's this coming from? It was really challenging, Marion, and that is actually why I started taking Akashic Record Reading, because that gave me a platform to really guidance to, okay, you're going in, you're asking these specific questions, and you're getting answers. It did kind of freak me out with the reconnective healing when I was receiving answers, especially some of the experiences I had, where I did have a couple experiences where someone's deceased loved one would come in, or I one time I got a message from someone that was still alive and connected to my client, but they were kind of concerned that I was working on my client. So like to get these messages and to trust that and not be like I'm cracking up, it's, you know, to get that validation from your client helps, you know, oh, when I gave this message, it made sense. Uh, Maybe I'm not just making all of this up. And it was interesting to me too, because I'm more clear cognizant. So I get these nudges, I don't always see things. I don't always hear things. So for me, I think that was even harder because I'm like, well, if you see things, yeah, maybe you think you're cracking up, but at least it's like it's visible. Or if you hear things, I've had the times where I hear things and it seems almost more believable to clear cognizance. Wow, I've gone through like a tough time of believing myself because information just comes in. And I'm like, am I making this up? <laughs> you know, but it really is that validation from the clients and trusting and going in with the shamanism that I've learned, it's really going in and asking to be that hollow bone. I don't want to bring my stuff 
into my preconceived notions, any judgments may I may have, any stories into a session with the client. I want to be totally empty so that any information that comes in is for the highest good of that client without anything of mine being attached to it. So you've mentioned re, you know, reconnective healing a few times. What does that entail? What is that like? It is an energy form of healing off body. And we can also, practitioners can also do that at a distance. It's about reconnecting you to your divine blueprint. Our energy gets very out of balance when we have a life trauma, when we have emotions that we don't process. And what reconnective healers learn to do is just kind of feel that energy and their intention is really to bring that person back into balance. So during the reconnective healing seminar, I saw miraculous physical healings. During my own practice, I've seen miraculous physical healings. But It's really interesting with reconnective healing because it does work energetically to bring that person into balance. I since have learned that it also, I feel, is very important to work with a person on that mind level because I've seen healings go backwards because, okay, so you're healed physically, but if you're repeating the same pattern or negative behavior, or if you have that same story running in your head, it can be easy for disease to manifest in a different way. So I do love energy healing. I think it is priceless, but I do feel like it is very important to also follow it up with that inner work. You know, you hear a lot of times that people are going through these patterns, but they don't really even realize that that's what's happening. How do we handle situations and like that as far as healing goes? It is being cognizant and loving to yourself. That is kind of the hardest thing because when we start, when I started to look at how I was, listen to how I was talking to myself when I was sick, I was embarrassed, honestly. I was like, you majored in psychology. Seriously, Jen? What's, what's wrong with you? You know, so again, it can feel like another way to insult ourselves. But if we are self-sabotaging in any way, if we are numbing in any way, that's because we're hurt. That's because some some time in our life we were hurt and we adapted this behavior or habit or pattern to cope. And that's something to shine love on and light on and hug that inner child and understand that we want better for ourselves. How can I change this into a more positive pattern instead of reaching for that gallon of ice cream, you know, how can I react in that moment? What can I do to self-soothe? That's going to really be good for me and not something I'm going to beat myself up about later. And even when we fall backwards, because we do, we're human, we're not like, oh, I've decided this and we're moving straight forward. It's kind of a very crooked path and a dance. Even when we find ourselves, you know, hey, we did eat that half gallon of ice cream, being kind to ourselves, knowing, you know what, that's a self-soothing pattern that I've adapted and it needs to be looked at with love. And how can I heal it? Same is true with relationships. We've all had friends where, you know, and I was certainly in the pattern, you know, when I was younger of getting in relationships that weren't healthy for me. And whether that be friendships or boyfriends or any kind of relationship, work relationships, really loving ourselves enough to know that we deserve more. I really do feel like it always does come back to that self-love and self-worth and just starting to listen to yourself, stop yourself, set an alarm a couple times a day and be like, hey, where was my mind? Was my mind on all the troubles in my life? Was I beating myself up? Or was I being supportive? Am I looking forward to things in the future? Am I taking a moment to do things that bring me joy? Am I basking in happy memories or sad memories? There are so many little things we can do that take a couple of minutes that can really shift our attention and consciousness, make us more mindful. And in that, we really do need to be kind to ourselves at the same time. Where do you feel that people get stuck the most? In the same story, it's really challenging. And the work that I do, I hear horrific stories. That has been the hardest part of the work that I do, really hearing that there are very unhealthy families out there, so and unhealthy relationships. And people get stuck really 
not believing that they deserve everything. They don't deserve the relationship of their dreams. They don't deserve to be financially independent. They don't deserve to have happy, healthy relationships all around them. Or they feel like, you know, if one part of their life is okay, well, then there must be another part that's out of balance. Really stepping into that self-worth and knowing, yes, I do deserve this. And it doesn't matter what happened in the past. Maybe I have punished myself enough. Maybe I've held myself back enough worrying about that reliving it and maybe it's time for me to give myself permission to move forward so really a lot of people just get stuck because they've been in that pattern so long and it's comfort it's comfortable in our comfort zone no matter how uncomfortable it is and change is scary so people loving themselves enough to know you know what it's a baby step Maybe, you know, everything feels out of whack right now. I don't like my job. I don't like my friends. I don't like my, you know, spouse. I don't like a lot of the things around me. Where do I start? And it's always picking an area. For me, it had to be my health. I could not do anything unless I was healthy. So physical health was the first thing for me to heal. I wasn't able to look at other aspects of my life until that was in place. So picking one area and also, Marianne, bringing joy into our lives is so important. And I talk to clients about reliving a happy moment in your life because we have no problem going over something someone said or did or we said or did over and over and over, but we don't allow ourselves to bask in a moment of joy. So even taking a few moments and basking in a moment that brought you joy, whether it was in nature or a moment that had you laughing or you know, proud moment, something that brought you joy, even that can really switch that self-worth on like hey I did experience happy moments and life is good because we're we're shown so many negative things through the day and in the world that are going on it really is up to us to choose that we are going to surround ourselves with positive influences that we are going to start to think a little healthier and that we're going to start to know that we deserve the life of our dreams I know for a lot of people that can sound a little, a little like a reach for them, especially when they are in this place where they're in the car driving two hours to get to work. They feel overwhelmed and stressed. I mean, how do they go from that place to feeling like they can find any peace and calm in their life? Yeah. And that's, that's a perfect example because for those two hours that you're commuting, what are you listening to? Are you listening to the news? Oh, God forbid, that's not a good thing, <laughs> place to go. And why don't you put on your favorite music? Why don't you get an audio book that's inspirational? Why don't you say a little prayer or set intentions or say what you're grateful for? There are always these moments that we don't recognize we have it when we're in a groove of just doing the same thing. And that is my favorite thing to work with clients on because there are these little moments. And I work with a lot of busy moms. I don't have time to do that. Well, you know what? You probably have time in the shower. <laughs> Make that your meditation time instead of going through your to-do list or beating yourself up about something. Make that your meditation time where you're seeing the water just release all the negativity and wash all the negativity down the drain. Maybe put your hands on your heart and say something that you're grateful for. You're grateful that you're awake and living another day. It's really those baby steps and little windows of time that can start to make the difference. So I know that you talk about being in flow. What is that and what does that feel like? <sighs> I love flow and alignment. Well, it is challenging as humans. We are taught to put our will on everything. Well, this should be this way. I want this by this time. And it's really challenging to let go and trust. Flow is really that state where we can move beyond our will and really maybe have a general idea of what we want, but allow allow the opportunities to open up for us, allow something maybe even greater to come in. And when we're in that flow state, it can be in a creative process. Like for me, dance and writing, I'm in that flow state. It's just something is flowing through me and it feels so good. When you're doing something that you love, 
you enter that flow state. And when you live from that space, I don't know anyone that can live from that 24 seven, but Mm -hmm. even when you enter those moments, that's when the synchronicities come in. That's when life feels easy. When something happens unexpectedly amazing and you're like, wow, you know, where did that come from? Just really relaxing and enjoying instead of trying to control everything. And I know that is a big ask, you know, releasing and letting go feels really, really hard because if people have it in their head that they can't trust, maybe they've had a bunch of relationships that they they have not it has not served them to trust those relationships, loving themselves enough to know that when we do this inner work on ourselves, when we release some of those past stories and the effect that they've had on us, when we move into forgiveness work, whether that be you know, writing a letter and burning it, whether that be just deciding I've suffered enough, I'm not going to let that bother me anymore or control me anymore. We're really allowing ourselves and giving ourselves permission to move into that state of flow, to move into that state of trust, to open up to the universe that things can be perhaps better than I ever imagined. And that is really truly when the magic can come in. So what would you say is like the first step to developing that deep inner trust? I really do feel it's self-love and self-worth, starting with saying I love you to yourself. Can you do that? Saying something that you're grateful for yourself for. Are you a good friend or a good listener? Do you make meals for your kids? All these things like we don't give ourselves credit for. Have you made a meal for someone in your life? Have you reached out to a friend in need? Do you have a pet that you like to cuddle with? Do you have plants that you take care of? Are you, you know, do you love to do something creative? Do you love to draw? Like giving ourselves credit for something that we do and are is so important for knowing we're okay, knowing we're deserving, and really starting to let go and trusting that the world is a safe place. I am a loving being. The world is full of loving beings. And I do trust that goodness can come to me. I know self-worth is such a big deal for so many people. You know, how can they do that inward dive where they can start loosening the grip of that negative thought pattern? It's starting to listen to yourself. I did actually wear rubber band in the beginning and snapped it every time I said a negative thought and boy, my arm, my hand was sore at the end of the day, you know, really starting to listen to yourself. What are you telling yourselves? And there's so many things that I hear people say. And I've certainly said to myself where you do, you make a misstep and you say, boy, that was stupid or I'm stupid, you know, and you don't even catch it. But if you say that enough times during the day, it starts to sink in. So really starting to be aware, how are you speaking to yourself? What are the relationships around you reflecting back to you? We teach people how to treat us. If we do not feel worthy, guess what? We're going to have relationships around us that are reflecting that we are not worthy. So starting to take a gentle look, and I do say that gentle look, because you don't want to become overwhelmed. You just want to take a little assessment. How do I speak to myself? How do the people around me speak to me? What am I doing every day to bring myself joy? Am I encouraging joy or am I encouraging disempowerment and I encouraging empowerment and inspiration and really just taking it one step at a time and maybe in the shower you're saying gratitude for yourself for a minute oh it's so uncomfortable Marianne even for a minute it's uncomfortable but if you can do that it starts to shift because we know we beat ourselves up much more than a minute a day (laughs) 80% Mm -hmm. of our thoughts are negative as most humans Uh, And we have 60,000 thoughts a day. So it really, we have a lot of wiggle room to change those thoughts. Thank goodness for that, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it has me kind of thinking, you often hear people talk about how they have negative family patterns too. Yes. And, you know, it's it's interesting. If we get anything from our family, it's definitely that. What are some ways they can overcome that? 
is recognizing that hurt people hurt people. If your parent did not have a happy, healthy upbringing, they did not know how to raise you in a happy, healthy way. If someone is happy and well-adjusted, guess what? They're going to treat other people with love and kindness because that was what was taught to them. It is really understanding and having compassion for the loved ones in our lives that didn't know any better. They were acting from what they knew at the time, what they were shown. And if we can show them love and also, you know, express boundaries because some people will not change and are not open to hearing this stuff, respecting ourselves enough to set healthy boundaries. Maybe you don't spend three days over Thanksgiving. Maybe you go for a day. <laughs> you know, Maybe you don't allow the person to go on negatively for an hour. Or you limit your time for 10 minutes on the phone. There's way to set, ways to set healthy boundaries. And there's ways to just kind of get some compassion and understanding for what those family members also went through. And it can really help you it can help grant some peace around knowing that it wasn't about you. It's usually never about you. It's about them. It's about their fear. Usually if someone is controlling, it's because they fear being out of control. Really looking at it in a loving and kind way and maybe even sending them love, seeing the the good things in people too helps a lot because we can tend to concentrate on the thing that drives us crazy about someone instead of the beautiful aspects of them. And I do believe you know, 99.999% of people have beautiful aspects about them. So when we focus on those, we're also allowing that energy, our energy bodies meet before we connect in person. So if we're thinking the whole way out over to seeing, you know, a relative, oh, they're going to be this and they're going to say that, we're really not allowing for any other possibility to come in. Whereas if we are thinking, you know what, they really do know how to cook. <laughs> they're really good at this. They do make me laugh. If we're thinking that and filling ourselves with that positive energy, when we are showing up to that interaction, you might be very surprised with what that person meets you with. Yeah, it's interesting how much of that is all based on perspective. And if our filter is broke, the lens which we view the world is broke, you know, that's how we're going to view everything. And it's interesting when our parents have that view, how they pass it on to their children and so on. Yes, but we always have the possibility to break that pattern. And that is the beauty of mindfulness and consciousness, really understanding that because they were hurt, because they didn't know how to raise a kid doesn't mean that we can't learn how to. It really is. And especially now with all of these resources, like your show, you know, that bring this awareness to people. There are so many resources where people can learn and can do this deep dive into healing, and it is about healing ourselves. We can't heal anyone else. We can't fix anyone else. We can be the example and hope that other people are like, hey, what's she doing? She's really happy, you know, or <laughs> ask us, but we can't drag anyone else along, and they won't, they won't appreciate it. They really won't appreciate it. No one really wants to be fixed, you know, or, because then you're telling them that they're broken. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot there where, you know, they really have to get to this point where they want to fix themselves. And if not, hey, that's okay. You know, we respect and honor them where they are at. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's easier said than done. In a lot I know, of I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things you talk about that I'm so impressed with, you talk about how self-worth is really kind of broken into three pieces. I'd love for you to kind of share a little bit about that because a lot of times when people think about self-worth, they don't realize that there's a mind, spirit, body connection to all of that. Yeah. Well, the mind is how we speak to ourselves, how we repeat the patterns and the stories the body, what are you feeding yourself? Are you getting some exercise? How do you look at your body? Are you getting enough sleep? There's so much there too. And spiritually, like, what are you, are you connecting? Are you connecting to your soul that is unconditional love? Or are you really leading yourself by that 
limited mind and only in quiet and turning off the phone and all the distractions can we really get to that spirit place and connect within and Again, it doesn't have to be, I'm not asking my clients to do hours of meditation. Who has time for that? It really is these little windows of time where, you know, you could put your hand on your heart and take a couple of long, slow, deep breaths and just check in. How am I doing? What one of my favorite meditations is just listening. Turning everything off and just listening is such a beautiful way to know that, wow, I'm not aware of one tenth of what goes on because suddenly we'll hear the cars in the background, we'll hear the wind, we'll hear birds, we'll hear all these other things that we just block out most of the time. So even just that quietness, allowing yourself to not just be a victim to that constant chatter that is going on in your head is so super powerful. And it really is necessary for that deep healing and for that deep sense of self-worth to tap into that soul, if you will, inner self, that no consciousness that knows that you are so much more than your body that is able to connect to, to the love of the planet and the nature and the connectivity between all of us. And that really does improve your self-worth. I mean, nature is the greatest healer for spiritual healing too, to even go outside and feet on the grass and put your hands on your heart and just feel that connection. So mind, body, spirit, it is really important, all of those to be in alignment, to feel that true self-worth. And that's exactly where we all want to be at some point. (laughs) Yes. Because it's interesting, you know, we may be in alignment with two places, you know, hey, I I feel like my self-talk is good, but, you know, my self-love is off, you know, and so you, it's interesting how we look at just self-worth as it is, and it's really kind of, I wouldn't say a balancing act, but it's really a daily practice. It is a daily practice. And, you know, self-care, I know that word can be kind of overused sometimes, but self-care goes so much deeper than the bubble bath. Self-care is... How you're speaking to yourself? Are you setting healthy boundaries in relationships? Is your house cluttered or clear of clutter? So you're allowing more energy in. Self-care is so many levels. And again, it can be body, mind, and spirit. How are you nurturing yourself? How are you taking care of yourself? If think of it like a pet or a child, you would be showering them with love and care. Are you treating yourself like that? Are you talking to yourself like that? Are you giving yourself enough nutrients and care and time out in nature? Really, I love looking at it that way. Like, are you treating yourself like you would a loved one or a pet? (laughs) Because most people don't give themselves that love. That would be probably very true. (laughs) (laughs) They probably love their pets more or a loved one or what have you. But yeah, you, you hear that often where you have, we just have this negative thought process going over and over and over and over again. And so I know you actually came up with a new way that people can kind of shift that and be able to focus daily on their personal journey. Yes, I'm so excited. So Love 365 is an online community and year-long journey. And the first week is free. And it is a daily exercise, writing, and affirmation on love. And most importantly, self-love and self-worth. And each week has a little theme. And we dive deep (laughs) into just really how to love ourselves and how to bring about that self-worth. And I am a big believer in short exercises. I'm not going to have any, you know, none, none of the exercises are more than a few minutes long. And if you don't have time, you could just say the affirmation. The affirmation is related to the little bit of writing. And it won't take more than a few minutes, but that attention, if you're spending 15 minutes a day focusing on your self-love and self-worth, you're going to feel a real shift. And there is an online community as well to ask questions, to talk with others, get support. And I am so, so grateful to be birthing this and to support people on their journey. 
Yeah. I mean, gosh, you've been on such a journey yourself. I was excited to hear about this. What are some of the topics that are covered? Well, I start with love through the chakras and we, I talk about each part of the body too, and emotionally, physically, how we can maybe how we are not bringing ourselves love. There's a whole week on focusing on the body, different parts of the body and bringing love in. Even when we're in pain, we tend to focus negatively on that part of the body. So it's really about being positive and shining love into that part of the body. I also talk about a lot about different mind things to switch up easy mind tools, you know, things like gratitude, but going a little deeper, the tools are all very different. There's going to be 365 of them. So they are all very different, but they're easy to and accessible. And there are going to be ones that stick with you that become daily rituals. There are going to be ones that are uncomfortable. Maybe those you need to do a couple times or come back to, <laughs> uh, But it is really about loving yourself enough to commit to yourself daily to do this practice. We all know we can veg out, you know, to a Netflix for hours a night, you know, possibly. So why can't you give yourself 15 minutes a day to really focus on what you want, which is to love yourself and feel worthy so you can create the life of your dreams from that space. There is going to be a week on setting boundaries, a week on dealing with emotions. There there are so many different weeks with different topics and they all dive deep into that self-love and self-worth through the body, mind, and spirit. So I understand also you do virtual healing circles. What are those like? Yes, I am doing those for my class members, and I'm very excited. I use a bunch of different healing modalities, and I love connecting energetically with people. I love the feeling of a group is really powerful, and for us all to set intentions, for us all to hold each other in that light, it just adds to that power and connectivity and kind of the love that we can all feel and know that we're all in it together, especially over the last couple of years, we could have felt very isolated, but it's really about this connectivity and knowing that no matter what we've been through, guaranteed there have been other people that have been through that, holding space for each other, feeling that love and being able to transmute some of that negative energy to love. So if someone is suffering from any, like maybe a mental illness or a physical illness, would this be a place for them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also have private sessions and I love working with people. I love, you know, the Love 365 would also be a great place to just start getting those tools, start getting the foundation, start getting in the habit, join the community where you can get support, really embrace this change. We will resist change. And just knowing that we can have the support along the way from not just me, but a community, it really helps you feel not alone, supported. And when you backtrack, you know, or seemingly backtrack as we do as humans, you're going to have the support and love around you to know that it's okay. It's all a part of the journey. So what other topics does Love 365 tackle? We tackle so many topics. I tackle how to, you know, clear your space for love. I talk about how to really tap into your emotions. I tap, I talk about how to move beyond fear and worry, which is such a easy place for us to go as humans. I talk about ways to expand your awareness to bring in more self-love, how to keep moving forward when life throws you curveballs, inviting happiness into your life, inviting inspiration into your life, how to set loving intentions. There's a week on, on setting intentions, really, and kindness, you know, how to be kind to others and kind to yourself. There are so many topics covered, (laughs) like I said, 365 of them. And I dive deep into all of them and offer easy tools for all of them because I want it to feel easy. I want this self-love practice to really seem like 
something that you can't live without. It's so simple for you to do every day. And it's something that lifts you up and you feel, you, you notice the difference when you don't do it every day. So are these tools that you develop through your own healing journey? Yes, they are. And from working with clients, that has been the biggest teacher to see the similarities in people over the last 15 years and working with clients. And that is where the self-love and self-worth work has been born is really noticing that we all do have these limits on ourselves and they're usually from a past pain or trauma. So how do we move past that in the loving, kind way? How do we not allow that to inform our future and our daily life? And how do we lovingly embrace ourselves so that the world around us can be reflected in that? So Jenny, I know that your story has been featured on PBS and it's been in magazines, TV shows, radio shows, you name it. Do you think that your story really helps people to at least find a little hope in their journey when they're going through such a difficult time? Yeah, it is challenging. And there are so many levels to healing and layers to healing, too. So being kind with yourself, it's never like, okay, I've arrived. Everything's wonderful and I'm perfect. You know, like (laughs) I'm never going to feel like that. There's always work to be done. It's beautiful to be human, you know, but to be able to laugh at it and enjoy the journey. And, you know, I had my hardest transformation over the last year and a half, caring for my mom while she was ill and having her pass when she was my best friend. And grief is something that is, whew, that is the worst possible emotion I can ever recall experiencing, but to be able to use some of these challenging experiences to transform us in positive, loving ways, to not turn us into people that don't love anymore, or that are not open to life being okay anymore. And that's certainly how I felt this, you know, when she passed, but loving ourselves enough to support ourselves through the healing journey, no matter what happens to us, because there always have been people that have made it through similar circumstances and they've come out okay. And knowing that with the support of a community, with you taking that time for yourself and that deep self-care on all those different levels, you can come out okay. And you can come out transformed in a more positive way, that metamorphosis, like the butterfly, really just loving yourself enough to know that transformation is always possible. You know, it's so interesting when people look to make dramatic changes. Usually that happens at the beginning of the year and everything kind of fizzles out because I think they get really overwhelmed with everything they're having to deal with. Do you think now is a good time to start implementing change instead of waiting for the beginning of the year? Oh, yeah, yeah. Get yourself ready before the holidays kick in. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) You know, I mean, these are, you know, um, where we are, this is the summer, you know, so we're heading into fall and winter. And that can be a time of more isolation and depression. So why not have these tools now? Why not go into the new year with a couple of months of this under your belt? So you're feeling more empowered and stronger, starting the new year off stronger, rather than, oh, boy, I gotta lose that 50 pounds, or I gotta, you know, why not start off Now, learning how to love yourself. So when you are setting those intentions, you're doing them from a very loving space. Well, I love that because it is, you know, it's interesting because when I think of the beginning of the year, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm setting my intentions, doing all this. And it just can be so overwhelming most of the time. You're like, there's just so much to do. Yeah, absolutely. And it is about these baby steps. And if we look at our life as a whole, it might become very overwhelming, especially if you've been in a negative space. When I was sick, a lot of the things around me reflected that illness in different ways. So being kind to yourself, it's baby steps. It's these little, that's why I love 360, love, love 365. It's these 15 minutes a day of just committing to yourself 
of, you know what, I'm going to treat myself to this today and I'm going to feel better because of it. And I'm going to show myself a little self-love and you are going to start to feel the difference really soon. Well, Jenny, I mean, we could talk for hours. That's never been a problem for us. (laughs) Where can our listeners connect with you, learn more about Love 365 and be part of your community? JennyMannion.com is the best place to go, J-E-N-N-Y-M-A-N-N-I-O-N.com, and you could sign up for the free seven days and continue on this journey with me, and I would be so excited to have you there. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. I appreciate it so much, Marianne. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny. It's always such an honor to spend time with you. And I was so excited we got to talk about your new app, Love365. Again, if you'd like to connect with Jenny Mannion, you can at her website, JennyMannion.com, for more information. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.